So our ultimate goal is to be able to use homomorphisms out of a group to tell us something important and deep about the structure of that group via the first isomorphism theorem, which is going to say that the image of that homomorphism is isomorphic to the factor group of the domain by the kernel of that homomorphism. So our first step is going to be to understand in what sense homomorphisms are different from isomorphisms. How do they give us some partial information about a group? And what properties that were preserved by isomorphisms may or may not be preserved by homomorphisms? So first things first. A homomorphism is first and foremost a function from one group to another group. And if I want a function that's going to be capable of telling me anything about the structure of those groups, we're going to need to know something more about that function, because not just any function will do it. Let's start by way of example. Suppose I take the dihedral group of the square, the group of rotations of a, of a regular four-sided polygon. That group has these eight elements in it, um, the r being a 90-degree rotation, the t being a reflection about an axis of symmetry, and everything else being compositions thereof. So this is a group of order eight. Suppose that I also take the group Z4, so the cyclic group of order 4, uh, with uh, integers with addition. Is there a way for me to create a function from D4 to Z4 that's capable of telling me something about D4? And if so, what would that function look like? So here's an example of what I might do. If I wanted my function to somehow illuminate the difference in the dihedral group between those elements which describe rotations of the square and those elements which describe reflections of the square. Could I use a function to do that? So, as a reminder, is there a function which could take the identity, the single rotation, which we call r, r squared, r cubed, and r to the fourth, which is again the identity. Is there a function that could take all of those rotations, in which we see all of the numbers 1 through 4 on the, on the right side of the square here, so I haven't flipped over the square at all, and group all of those together in a way in which t and tr and tr squared and tr cubed, those will all be grouped together as well because those are all reflections, but that they're going to be grouped separately from the rotations. Is there a function that's going to allow me to do that? Well, if we want that function to preserve structure in some way between these two groups, Probably one of the more important things we wanted to do is we wanted to send the identity element of the first group to the identity element of the second group. So for sure, the identity transformation of the square should get sent to the identity element of z4, which is the number 0, mod 4. And if the identity is getting sent there, and if I want to group it together with the other rotations that are not flipping my square over, then that means that those rotations should all be getting sent to 0 also. Now where should I send the reflections? Well. If I want to send the reflections to somewhere that makes sense, because my reflections are all, first of all, supposed to be different from the rotations, I don't want to send them to zero. So I want to send them to one, two, or three. Um, but I want to send them to some place that acts enough like the reflections themselves that it will be able to sort of stand in for them. What do we know that makes all these reflections similar to one another? Well, they all are elements in the dihedral group of the square that have order two. They're all equal to their own inverse. So it might be a good idea if we decided to try sending those elements to an element of z4, which is its own inverse. And there's only one of those elements. That's the number 2, mod 4. So maybe we can get away with sending all the reflections to 2. Is this a homomorphism? Is this preserving of structure in a way that's going to let us compare these two groups in a fruitful way? Well, let's take a look at what happens if we do operations in these two groups. If I take two rotations, let's say r and r squared, but they really could be any two rotations. If I compose two rotations together in the dihedral group, the result is another rotation. Well, what's going to happen if I compose the images of those rotations using the arithmetic of the group on the right, z4? Well, each of those rotations is getting mapped to a 0, and a 0 plus a 0, a rotation composed of the rotation is going to get sent to a 0 plus a 0, gives me a 0 once again which still represents a rotation. So all my rotations are closed under the operation over here in D4, and their images, which just consist of the number 0, are all closed as well in the group Z4. All right, what happens if I take, for example, a rotation and a reflection? If I compose a rotation and a reflection together in the dihedral group, the result, we can prove, is a reflection. So R cubed, composed with TR, for example, 
r cubed times tr is going to give me tr squared in d4. And tr squared is also a reflection. Now what does that look like in the target group z4 over on the right? Well, my rotation gets sent to 0, my reflection gets sent to 2, and if I compose them together in z4, I'm going to get 0 plus 2, but 0 plus 2 is 2, which also represents a reflection. So we can see there's some structure preservation going on here. The same ways in which rotations and reflections compose together over here in d4 are also reflected by the ways in which their images 0 and 2 add together mod 4 in the group z4. So there's a structure preservation going on here in that if I use the operation in my first group and then apply my function, so if I do a times b using the, the multiplication of the group g, and then I apply the function phi, that the result that I get is the same as if I had instead applied phi individually to each of a and b, and then used the operation in the target group h to combine the results together. The results are the same. This is the same property that we saw when we introduced isomorphisms way back earlier in the semester. It's what we called operation preserving, or structure preserving, or structure respecting. Because it says that it doesn't matter whether I choose to do an operation on two elements in the domain before I apply the function, or if I apply the function first and then use the operation in the other group, that the result ends up being the same. The so-called product rule is what we also called the homomorphism property, back when we were talking about isomorphisms. And any function which at least has this, it turns out has enough power to tell us something about these two groups. Even if it's not a bijection, like an isomorphism would be, even if it's not one-to-one -one and or not onto, any function which nevertheless respects the structure by having this product rule, this homomorphism property, can still tell us something. And therefore we call those functions homomorphisms. So clearly the groups D4 and Z4 are not in fact the same. They're not isomorphic in the way that we talked about isomorphisms earlier in the course. After all, for example, there are two finite groups that have different orders. D4 has got order 8, Z4 has got order 4. So we know for sure these two groups cannot be isomorphic. But not only that, this function that I've set up is neither one-to-one, -one, because we have here four different elements that all have the same image, for example, nor is it onto because 0 and 2 are getting hit in Z4, but 1 and 3 are not. And yet, because of the structure preservation, we still are going to be able to say something. that Somehow, this function was capable of partitioning the group D4 into a subset of elements which all have enough similarity with one another that they can be grouped together and all get sent to 0. Those are my rotations. And then the other set in that partition is all the reflections, which have enough in common with one another that we can give them all the same image of two under this structure-preserving function. And that partition of d4 into two pieces, the reflections and the rotations, acts an awful lot like the subgroup of the numbers 0 and 2 in z4, which is the image of this function. And so that is the sense in which this homomorphism has given me a partial picture, an incomplete picture, tells me some of the structure of the dihedral group of the square. And as a recap, the way in which it did that is it told me that d4 can be subdivided into all the rotations, all of those that are getting sent to 0, and all the reflections, all getting sent to 2. And respectively, the way in which those rotations and reflections behave with respect to one another in d4 is exactly the same as the way that 0 and 2 behave with respect to one another in z4. If we're thinking about the dihedral group, there are important differences between, for example, r and r squared. But if we squint, they have enough in common that we can blur the distinction between them and still make them sort of, in a meaningful way, a part of the same subgroup or coset of a subgroup that have similar properties within themselves. And that's the power of homomorphisms. We want to be able to build on examples like this to figure out what is it about the theory of homomorphisms that let us make these kinds of comparisons, and how can we make these kinds of comparisons more fruitfully to tell us something about the structures of groups that we might not otherwise be able to get our hands around.